So here it is, the final world football phone-in of 2018 with me, Hugh Vickery. That's despair, I can hear it. Boos, hisses, I can only apologise that Dotton isn't here for all of you uh, avid listeners, but what I can deliver for you uh, is Mr Tim Vickery. Hello. Hello, uh, Hugh, very good evening. I'm really looking forward to kicking the ball around for, for a couple of hours. <laughs> And while we're doing it, let's uh, let's raise a raise a glass and toast to uh, some good times gone by, and who knows, maybe some better times to come. And Mr. John Durden, hello to you. Good morning, Hugh. How are you today? Very well indeed. We're here to cover all of your South American, your Asian football stories in full effect, and I will try my hardest uh, to cover Europe for all of you listening. But what I'm asking for tonight is for you to tell us about your moment of the year. What was the pinnacle of 2018 for you as a football fan? And we will move on to talk about your New Year's resolutions for 2019 as well. What will you promise to stop or start doing next year? And what should your club maybe be doing from here on out? Reminder, you can call 0808590963. Text us at 85058. Tweet at BBC Five Live. We are with you for the next at two hours. Now, Tim... Let me ask you, let's kick it off by asking what your moment of 2018 was. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking about that when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you posed the nugget. And I think <laughs> it would have to be. Um, and my favourite player in, in the world is, uh, is the Colombian, Juan Fernando Quintero. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, uh, I, I saw him, I remember seeing him come off the bench in 2012 as a, just as a, as a teenager for his side in Colombia, Atletico Nacional. And my eyes just popped out. It's like, who is this? Where there was darkness, suddenly there is clarity. A left-footed playmaker who just sees everything around him. Uh, Just a a magnificent talent who went off the rails. Uh, And uh, he he represents, if if I could play football, and he represents me on the field so much because he did exactly what I would do if I was in his position – uh, lose a little bit of focus by getting over obsessed with music and eating too much. <laughs> so he didn't actually play for Colombia in a competitive game between the 2014 World Cup and the 2018 World Cup. He was he was he was he was lost. Start of this year, he he went to River Plate of Argentina on loan from from Porto in Portugal, and you could see it coming back. You could see it, and you're thinking, you know, he just might be in with a chance of getting into the World Cup squad got into the World Cup squad. And uh, my moment of the year uh, is, uh, it was Colombia's first, first game mm. ag- against, uh, against Japan. And he's stuck in a free kick that went underneath the arches, <laughs> underneath the wall and in. And, you know, I, I just got this feeling of utter joy and, all, mm. and perhaps vindication as well. And I let, let out this totally involuntary, you know, shout of goal and, uh, uh, and, and her indoors. Where were you started, watching? Started running and I was, I was at home in my kind mm. of office stroke studio stroke living room. <laughs> uh, and uh, she kind of ran in. What on earth is going on? And saw that it was Columbia <laughs> celebrating. Have you suddenly become Colombian? No, I haven't. But I'm the fan number one of Juan Fernando Quintero. So to watch him come back, and he ended up uh, um, really effectively winning the Copa Libertadores for River Plate towards the end of the year. That has been my, my story of the year, and I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Fantastic story indeed. John, what about you? Well, I think there's two very obvious ones. I think one was um, Doncaster when <laughs> the mighty Blackburn Robbers clinched promotion back to the championship. But... Um, I think my favourite moment was, I think, the, the, the South Korea-Germany game during the World Cup in Russia, in Kazan. Um, hot day. Korea had lost the first two games, hadn't played very well. Um, and even before the game, the coach, Shin Tae-yong, said, we've got a 1% chance of winning this against the Germans. Nobody expects it to happen. Um, you know, Everyone in Korea had resigned themselves to losing all three games and coming home. Um uh, to, to to be greeted by that traditional South Korean mm. greeting at the airport to a returning sports team that fail, fans gather at the airport and throw candy at them, throw candy at the players, as they did in 2014 as they came back from Brazil. Um, but uh, I think that the, for the moment when Son Ho Min scored the second goal with a, into a completely open goal, the Germans, uh, the German goalkeeper was, you know, um, close to the South Korean uh, penalty spots in his own. And it was just uh, disbelief and um, excitement and sheer joy. And to see 
um, just the, the the celebrations in the stadium and how the Russians so excited as well to see it happen. And actually, what people forget, I mean, had had Mexico defeated Sweden on the same day, then Korea would have gone through to the second round. But that didn't happen. But even so, Korea, Korea were, were eliminated. But you know, those scenes and that goal and the sheer disbelief and joy was just fantastic to see. Well, absolutely. Two fantastic stories. I can only tell you as an English football well, fan. Well, there has to be third, Hugh. You're going to have to throw your one in now. <laughs> um, well, I think it's probably going to have to be. I think most England football fans had a pretty good summer. We weren't the most amazing team at the World Cup, that's for sure. And and it's unfortunate that Colombia had to be the opponents and missing James Rodriguez of all players on that night because I think they had a good chance of beating England and, and having a really good World Cup. Um but it had to be that penalty shootout, didn't it? I mean, you just thought, this is it once again. Going out on penalties, major tournament. Mm. It wasn't a great penalty to win it from Eric Dyer, but I can tell you, I got covered in beer. It was just one of those moments where it was like, I, disbelief. I mean, it was just like, we actually won <laughs> a penalty shootout. And it's funny because every single major tournament, England's managers are always, of course, we've practised penalties. We've been working on and we know how how the history's been, how bad they've been. To see a pretty awful penalty win it pretty much summed it up uh, for an English football <laughs> fan. It was the moment, uh, I guess, of the year for a lot of English football fans. Um, so, yeah, one from can, home, can I, I guess. Can I ask John a, a, a quick question? Um, about, John, what, what, sure. what, what's your, on, on an emotional level, what's your attitude towards the South Korean national team? I, know you, you're, you're, I think you're married to a, to a Korean woman. Yes. Um, so you know you live there, you've made your home there, and and so is. Do you feel a strong emotional bond on a personal level with the with with the South Korean national team? Yeah, I mean, I think partly because, um, as you say, you're involved in 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 the country and you know the people. I think that, that's it. I mean, we, compared to say England, which of course is my home national team, I actually know people in, involved in the South Korean national team and some of the staff and some of the players. Um, so when actually, I think at the 2012 Olympics. Korea played Great Britain in them. Um, I think well, I think it was quarterfinals of the of the football tournament. Um, my mum was not very happy because I said I wanted Korea to win that game. Um, I think partly because I think the, the concepts of a Great British football team didn't have that much emotional connection to myself because it never really happened before. Um, but I wanted Korea to win partly because it's a military exemption thing as well. It was talked about before if they get any kind of medal those players would be exempted from the military. Um, and it was kind of strange to watch Korea play uh, Great Britain on that day, but um, I want Korea to win. I, I do sometimes wonder what would happen if Korea played England at the World Cup. Um, but certainly, um, I do feel quite an emotional connection to South Korea. So when that, that German game was uh, you know, a, a special time because, as I said, it was completely unexpected and it made a lot of people very happy. Um, but I think it doesn't compare, of course, to 2002. I think that when it all started, mm. actually being in the country at that time um, was just literally people dancing on the streets after some of the games. And is it, it was, is it, uh, is it, it was easy, crazy. Is it easy to follow a team like um, South Korea, given just the passion and the joy and the approach from their fans and their players? Well, I mean, I guess so. I mean, the, the passion... Actually, this World Cup, and it's, it's happened in the past few months, I think starting in the World Cup. After 2002, there's a bit of a, um, a follow-on uh, boon from from that. I mean, the, the Koreans have always been into the national team much more than the domestic league. Um, and, and the success in 2002 fed on international team for a few years. But I think since about 2010, maybe, um, it's... The country had fallen out of love a little bit with the national team. It wasn't quite as popular as before. The games were not the big sellouts as they used to be. Um, you know, TV viewing figures were down. You know, the football wasn't great, and coaches were coming and going. Uh, but this, I mean, the second half of this year, you've seen really what happened. I think um, in 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 October, Korea played. I think Uruguay and Panama at home in two friendly games, and. Uruguay, I think, was uh, played in Seoul World Cup Stadium, 64,000 capacity, and it sold out within hours of going online, which hasn't happened for years. And the same thing with Panama, the, the game was a complete sellout within hours. Um, so I think partly because there's a new generation of young players 
who, who some people say because of her good looking, there's a bit of a K-pop factor in there as well. You, you get a lot of young girls following Korean football as well. It's, it's a very friendly environment for, for, for female fans, as is Japan as well. You find a lot, you know, over half the fans are, mm. are, are, are female. And I think at the moment, um, the team's playing some good football under a new coach. And uh, there's a bit of a feel-good factor back in the, in the national team. It's, it's also got back to its pre um you know, uh, post World Cup levels to 2002 in, in terms of popularity. Interesting one. Tim, what is it like for you in South America? Have you picked up a team and you think, you know, they're closer to you maybe than, than your home nation? Well, I, I live in Brazil mm. and Brazil is, is very isolated really from the rest of the continent. Uh, it, you know, it's um, the only one that speaks Portuguese. And it's been my home now for, for blimey, 24, more than, more than 24 years. Mm. I, my relationship with it is I, I have a love hate relationship with with Brazil in general, which I think is the only it's the only possible mature relationship you can have with this country. Although I, I have a kind of love hate relationship with England as well, um, but yeah. I am English. I mean, when it, when England play Brazil in a World Cup, then uh, I'm I'm on England's side. Even though if Brazil make progress, I make more money. <laughs> so that's a heart versus a wallet type of issue. But on my, with, with the Brazilian national team, it's a, I think it's a more complicated relationship than, than the one that John has with South Korea. Just because in football terms, Brazil comes with more baggage. Uh, and uh, you know, the, all, all of the marketing of the dream team that there's been in recent years, some of that is stuck in the craw a little bit. I think so, uh, increasingly that, that's stuck in, in, in the craw of a number of people. It's almost like the ad men have oversold their products. Because on, for a number of years, until recently, for a number of years, I really didn't like the team. I didn't like the way, even though I would I knew individual players in it or, you know, followed them all the way up, have a relationship much more with them than I have with, with, with England players. A lot of the baggage around the team, I didn't like. I didn't like the way that they played. Um, under the current coach, that's changed a little bit. I, I, I like the current coach very much who took charge in, in, in 2016. Uh, so I, I would, uh, I'm, I'm happier now when, 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 when they win, but it, it, it's a complicated, it's a complicated relationship, partly because again, unlike South Korea, you're trapped in a culture of football arrogance. Uh, now that football arrogance is is justified. You know they've won the World Cup more times than anyone else. The, the the arrogance is justified, but it can hit you as a foreigner. You know, oh. and it, it it can get get under your skin a little bit to be surrounded with it all all all, all the time. Um, so it, it's it, it it it's a complicated relationship. When I I think that they play with an intention to live up to the glory of their tradition, then I'm I'm all for it. Uh, so um, the, the, the current coach I see as an attempt to do that. And I, I don't think they had a bad World Cup at all. Um, the, the coach will argue, sorry about this England fans, but I agree with him, that Brazil were among, among the four best teams at the World Cup. Um, so I, that's, I, I, uh, my that's personal France. belief is Brazil were probably the best team at the World Cup in terms of creating yeah, possibly, chances in possibly. the final third. That game against Belgium was one of the most dominant second halves. If they could just have put the ball in the back of the net, they could have really... And that's, that's with a Neymar who wasn't at 100%. I just think if exactly. he was fit... Exactly. And if they hit the back of the net in that game, we would have been talking about something very different indeed. Yeah, and the coach still has nightmares about it. And he still he finds himself, you know, waking up in the middle of the night screaming that Courtois' hand isn't... It just isn't going to get there, you know. And mm. he, you know uh, uh, in his opinion, the, the best four sides were, were, were France, Croatia, Belgium and, and Brazil, um, which means no place for England in the mm. best four. But I, I agree with that, you know. And I, I was very, very impressed with, 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 with what England did in the World Cup, even from the first game. Um, well, a lot, of, a lot of people were disappointed with. I, you know, I, I, I liked it, and I, you, know, you, you can really see progress, which mm. I think has, has since been confirmed with uh, the, you know, the, the new European competition. Mm. Um, but and it, and the Brazil Belgian game for me was head and shoulders the best game in the World Cup, and it, it could have gone either way. Yeah. It's very, very, very narrow margins at, uh, at, at that level of the game. And as you so rightly and so fairly point out, you. Neymar wasn't 100%. Mm. Now, he comes out of the World Cup very badly, very, very badly. But that's more for kind of behavioural issues yeah, and diving absolutely. than for actual, for, for, for the quality of his play on the, on the field, which, bearing in mind he was easing his way back from, from, from injury, I don't think he, he, he disappointed at all on the field. 
Um, but it, it's fascinating to see where he's going to go now. You know, he's at an age. Mm. He's, he's he's coming up twenty seven. He's twenty seven in 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 about six weeks time. I would love to see him stop being Neymar Junior. I I want to I want to get rid of the junior things. I think you're 27, you know, for crying out loud. Don't <laughs> wander around with junior on your shirt. Time to take that away. He's now Brazil's captain, a responsibility that he didn't want going into the World Cup. He he, he now has that responsibility. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think he, him, firstly against Man United, you know, in the knockout stage of the Champions League, then in the Copa America, uh, which Brazil are hosting, now, there's real baggage there because mm. uh, Brazil have staged the Copa America on four occasions and they've won it on four occasions. So that pressure under which the team collapsed in 2014 in the World Cup, that pressure will be back. All right, the level of competition won't be as high, but, you know, um, you know that pressure's ticking away. You t- you're, when the, game, the knockout game starts, you're ticking down towards mm. a penalty shootout. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Remember Neymar at the end of the, the Costa Rica game in the World Cup where Brazil won it right at the end. And he's, you know, he's... he's, he's uh, He's, he's an absolute emotional wreck. So and th- that was the pressure that, that, that he was under. I was, I was doing a Brazilian TV show today, and we went through some of his quotes during the year. And there's one really interesting one that he gave uh, before the World Cup when he talks about how afraid he was. And I, th- I find that really fascinating mm. because and I think we forget how vulnerable footballers can be and how, how much of their perception of their own worth their value as a human being is in how well they perform on the football field. That's so public. You know, if, if you fail, that is, that's such a public way to fail. That's the fear that, that Neymar had during the World Cup, which I think provoked the reaction at the end of that Costa Rica game and provoked a reaction where he wouldn't speak for a while after the World Cup. Well, that pressure cranks right back up now, both in the Champions League with Paris Saint-Germain and with the Copa America in Brazil. So watch this space. That's one of the narratives of 2019. And now, John, I've got a couple of texts for you already. My moment of the year has to be Son Hyung min chasing down the ball for South Korea's second mm-hmm. in that game. Uh, mm-hmm. Sarah from Great Yarmouth actually says, although as I type this, I see uh, Johnny Durden stealing my thunder. <laughs> she goes on, though, to say, <laughs> Alistair Bruce Ball and Chris Sutton's commentary for Five Live was fantastic. I broke my hand hammering on the wall as he got closer and closer to the goal. I'm not even Korean. I'm English. But that moment just <laughs> took over me. And she also says, thank you for a wonderful year of world football phone in many more to come as well uh, hopefully and another one I'm not sure if it's true or whether it's a game or what you you know you've got to be clear my moment of 2018 says Chris from Spennymore is my J2 team Tokyo Verdi going to the playoffs and almost getting back into J1 but losing to Iwata in the final did that actually happen in real life or was that a game right and Tokyo Verdi has just appointed um, a young English coach to take them take over from next season Gary White who mentioned on this podcast before mm. he's a He's, uh, I think he's about 41, 42. He's, he, he's been coaching overseas for about 20 years. Uh, he started, I think, you know, in the Bahamas. And um, then he, he, he had big success with Guam in qualification of the World Cup. Mm-hmm. It, it actually won two uh, qualifiers, their first ever in history. When uh, had, had a spell in, um, in China, in the Chinese League. And then was most recently in, in, in charge of Taiwan. Um, and then Hong Kong national team, but he got um, headhunted by Tokyo Verdi, a former giant of um, Japanese football that's fallen on hard times. And I think he's um, he, he's got some Japanese coaching licenses, and he he's, he graduated from the the English FA's elite course as well. Mm-hmm. He's done courses in the US. He's very highly qualified. So I think this is a, his dream job. And I think now we get a real chance to see how good Gary White can be. And um, I think hopefully one day he'll he'll come to England and show what you know. There's lots and lots of good English talent out there too, um, who don't get, often get a chance at home. And then maybe in Tokyo he can show what he can do. Absolutely. So I guess that's the resolution, or I guess, or the dream for 2019 for Tokyo Verdi to get back into J1. Now, just a reminder, we've got some emails already in, but you can email up all night at bbc.co.uk. Uh, text us on 85058. Tweet at BBC Five Live. The number to call 0808 Now, let's get to some 
Uh, of your questions, hello guys. Question for the legend Dino tonight. My club, Orlando City in MLS, have just signed the 21-year-old Ecuadorian international midfielder. I hope I pronounced this correct, correctly. Uh, Diegson, Diegson, Sebastian Mendes from Independiente mm -hmm. de la Valle. What can Tim tell me about him? That's from MC Marston. I hope those are his initials. He's not some sort of rapper, MC Marston. But yeah, <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about Yegson Sebastian Mendes? Well, th this club, um, Independiente del Valle, it's, 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 a, it's a tiny little club on the outskirts of Quito. But what they do, and they do it really, really well, is they produce players to sell. Um, they've just sold one to, uh, to, to Spain, to Valladolid, a, a young centre-forward, Plaza. Uh, and, and Mendes is another one. that They invest in, in young talent and they groom young talent, perhaps better than any, anyone else is doing in South America at the moment. They, they, they do it really, really seriously. And they reached the, the final of the, the Libertadores, South American Champions League, two years ago with uh, a team of two experienced Uruguayans and nine home base players, uh, and they managed to sell all nine of them after, after reaching a final. So that, that's the business model, and they do it extremely well. Mendes is very strong physically uh, and ha has, has a good engine. Uh, I think there's, there's an interesting player there. Uh, I don't think he's uh, he's got magnificent creative skills that's going to open up the pitch in the last third of the field. I don't think he's going to do that, but I think he's uh, he's going to be a dynamic presence in the, in the central midfield, covering the defence, breaking up a, a, a opposition moves, and moving the ball swiftly to uh, to, to more, more creative players. So uh, what, what I think Orlando City have done is they've chosen a, a very very good club to go and do some business. Can I ping another quick question to, uh, to, to, to John? Go ahead, steal um, my job. Because it, 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 <laughs> it's, it's possible that even from the next World Cup, we might get the, the move up to 48. You know, it's, it certainly you know, looks like it's coming in for, for 2026, but it's possible that it might come in for, for 2022. Now, in, in my part of the world, that's just being greeted with a huge groan. You know, look at the last World Cup, how good it was. Oh, now they're going to mess the whole thing up, making it 48. I would imagine, John, in Asia, they think a little bit differently about it. Right, of course, because, I mean, Asia has four automatic spots and then and these tend to be taken by, of course, South Korea, Japan, now Australia, probably Iran. Um, and it's not much variation. So for, for the vast majority, you know, the, the other 42 nations in the um, AFC, you know, most of them don't even get close to even dreaming about a World Cup. So double that, double that allocation, then suddenly... You get teams like Thailand who can dream about it um, to all over, even like in, in the future, maybe even like India can just start dreaming about the World Cup. It just opens up um, the, the tournament to a whole ne next level of teams. Of course, I mean, I think people would understand that in the rest of the world there'd be some trepidation about having eight Asian teams um, in the tournament. But from an Asian point of view, I think it it just means that if you were to say, for example, the Thailand Federation now you really can say if we can keep improving a little bit by little bit, the World Cup is a possibility and it gives an incentive just to get better and better and it opens up and makes it a realistic possibility for many, many more nations. I mean, at the moment, it's just five or six, but have it eight, eight spots, then you're talking at 15, 20 teams who would have a chance of getting to the World Cups, which would be you know, unbelievable for them, I think. But maybe not for South America. Actually, Tim, I wanted to ask about 2019 as well. I mean, the Copa America you mentioned. What is the feeling that you know Qatar, of course, will be playing in that next summer? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, they're, they're not even being considered, um, which could well be a mistake. I mean, that they beat Ecuador recently, and they um, beat Switzerland too. But, did they? Good grief! Yeah, in October they beat Switzerland. The, 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 tremendous results yeah. then. Mm. Uh, at, at, at the moment, you know, because there, there's only 10 footballing nations in South America. So in recent years, they've, you know, two have been invited in from, from outside the continent. Traditionally, it's been Mexico plus one other, sometimes Costa Rica or, 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 uh, or the United States, Honduras came in. We have had Japan in, in, in the past. I, I remember watching Japan in 1999. And now it's Qatar as well. And at the moment, no one is even giving them a second thought, apart perhaps 
from Ecuador who saw that they have something. The, 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 I right. remember watching Qatar at under-17 level in 2005 and, and being amazed by the pace that they, they had up front. And, and that can travel South American defences. So I'll be very, very interested to see them because obviously it's an important part of their preparation to host their right. own World Cup. Yeah, fascinating to see how they get on. I mean, I think, as I said, they, they beat Switzerland in October, I think, and they drew with Iceland a few days later. So, And they've got... And gone are the days they don't have, you know, the most of the team used to be, of course, naturalised Brazilians, but that's kind of gone. You get, uh, they've got a Spanish coach who's been in charge of their local academy. The Aspire Academy is a huge facility in the country. It's bringing up you know, lots and lots of young players. And it'll be fascinating to see how they get on in South America next year. Where you're listening to the World Football phone with me, uh, Hugh Wisencroft, joined by Tim Vickery and John Durden, of course. And taking a bit of a look back at 2018, a bit like the F1 there, um, Tell us your moment of the year in 2018. It might have been the moment your team uh, guaranteed survival. Maybe you had a playoff or a cup final win. Maybe it was just a giant killing. Or maybe you just reached the third round or the FA Cup, for example, in England. Just a moment for your club. Uh, I don't know who's left the room, but hopefully I've still got Tim and John uh, with me. A reminder, you can email up all night at bbc.co.uk, uh, text 85058, tweet at BBC Five Live or call 08085 909 693. A question for you guys. John, if you're there, I'll start with you. I've recently purchased the most recent edition of a popular football manager game. All good other uh, games are available, of course. My ethos is usually buy cheap, sell high. Do you have any gems from your areas I might be able to add to my squad relatively cheaply with the potential to sell on in time? That's from Andy in Brighton. John, any young gems coming through in your region? Well, at one time, I, it's like a few years ago, I, I, I did help. Um, I think it was championship manager, I'm allowed to say, with, with some of their stats um, back in the day. But I think at the moment... Um, some good young players in Vietnam coming through. Nguyen Quang Hai, who was a uh, the star player of the recent Southeast Asian uh, football championships, which uh, Vietnam won for the second time in their history just a, a couple of weeks ago. Millions on the streets of Saigon and Hanoi. Um, he's a great player. <clears throat> um, can make, make things happen. And look, look at Vietnam. Look, um, look at the, the some of the leading teams. I think you you, sh- you should find some uh, lots of talented young players there to to sign. Um, I'm not sure to get a work permit though. Actually, if you if you're coaching an English team, but um, <laughs> if you're not, then you'll be all right. Uh, Tim, what about you? What about your region? I guess there's a lot of big names yeah, always well, coming through. Th- Indeed. Firstly, I have to declare um, that uh, I have no idea what any of these football manager <laughs> games entail. It, it's, uh, there aren't many advantages of being 53, but one of them is that you, you can feel comfortable about saying, uh, you know, sorry, new thing, we're closed. So I really don't know what they, what they are. I don't know how you win them or how you, how you gain points, but good luck to anyone who's doing them. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very good time to ask this question. Because uh, every two years at the start of the year, we have the South American Under-20 Championships, which is an, just an absolute gold mine of talent. It is where the, uh, the, the undoubted highlight of what I ludicrously call my career, uh, 2005 in Colombia, uh, you know, and I've, I've been boring everyone stupid about it ever since. Uh, I've got the first look at a, a little fella from Barcelona called Lionel Messi. Um, and, uh, you know, you're always looking every time you're looking for someone like that, people like that, who no one has heard of, but in, in the future are going to be are going to be household names all over the globe. Uh, and we've got the next version starting January the 17th. This uh, this year it, it's held in Chile. And there's uh, there's three names that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Um, but the ones that I'm most looking forward to seeing are the ones I don't know. You know who's going who's to emerge who I've never seen before. But anyway, of those who, uh, who already have something of a reputation, from Brazil, uh, a young man from the, the Santos Club called uh, Rodrigo, who is already sold to Real Madrid. You know, he's, 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 not, he's not turned 18 yet, and he's already, you know, once he turns 18, he's, he's on his way to, to Real Madrid. Who is... He's another one of these strikers that you see in wide spaces, and Brazil produces so many of these type of players. But there's, there's a difference with with Rodrigo, which is that he's more cerebral. He, he's not just 
wonderfully sinewy runner with the ball. You can see him thinking as well. Um, and physically, he's not quite there. And if, if he were physic, if he had physically filled out a little bit more, I think he may even be in the senior Brazil squad already. Oh, really? That's how good he is. But at the moment, he's losing all the 50-50 balls. Mm. Um, but he is certainly one to watch. From Argentina, um, Johnny D might have had a look at uh, this fella last <coughs> Saturday in the Club World Cup. Um, River Plate, uh, 18 year old <coughs> centre forward, Julian Alvarez, who uh, looks really, really classy, two footed vision. I don't know if you, if, you, if you saw the game, John, where um, River Plate beat uh, Kashima Antlers 4 0 for a third, fourth place off no, uh, in, in, in the Club oh. World Cup. Well, that makes it sound like it was a massacre. It really wasn't. Kashima hit the bar. They rattled the bar three times and they had one miraculously blocked off the line. It could have gone either way. And uh, two of River Plate's goals were scored in the last two minutes. So that the 4-0 scoreline is a little bit false. But the goal that decided it was River Plate's second goal. Uh, and uh, the fellow who makes it is, is this, this fellow Alvarez, who, who's receiving the ball in the penalty area, turning and just laying it sideways. It's just the, 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 the capacity to do the simple thing under pressure in the penalty area. And to see someone who's 18 doing that, that's remarkable. So uh, he's someone definitely to look at. And from Paraguay, um, Ivan Franco. Franco uh, plays for, for Libertad. He's a, he's a kind of very kind of curly-haired um, playmaker, will operate behind the two strikers, very, very fluent running with the ball. Um, he was born in 2000. It, it, it's, it, it's staggering wow. how young these people are. Um, not particularly big physically. Another one who will have to learn as he, goes, as, as he grows up, he'll have to learn when to part with the ball, um, when to go for the dribble. It, it, it's that, that, those decisions and the, the decision-making is one of the things that distinguishes the, the, the great players from the good ones. I'm very, very much looking forward to seeing him. And, and, and one player already considered an old friend, um, a, a centre-back from Colombia called Carlos Cuesta, because he played in this competition two years ago. And at that point, he'd already played a number of games for his club side, Atletico Nacional. The last two years haven't been particularly kind to him. He, he suffered a, a, a lot of injuries. But when I look at Carlos Cuesta, I'm seeing a possible prototype, if you like, of Franco Baresi, the great Milan defender. Now, a centre-back who, who uh, is reading a game, his positioning, his timing in, the, in, in a tackle. Look, really, really promising to me. I haven't seen him for about a year. I'm very much looking forward to seeing him again. So all of these and many others, they'll be in action in Chile <laughs> from January the 17th in the South American under-20s. Well, we'll keep an eye on it for sure now that you've uh, told us who we should be looking out for. We've got a caller on the line, gents. Uh, it's Jack from Maine. Hello, Jack. You there? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm here. Um, uh, and my, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, I apologise in Milwaukee. Um, Jack. No problem. Just let us know. Have you got a question or have you got a moment of the year to tell us? I have a, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, but my moment of the year would be when the U.S. D did not make the World Cup in <laughs> hope that we can hit the reset button. And uh, hopefully something <laughs> fruitful will be able to come from, uh, from that. We'll see, we'll see if that happens, though. We'll see. Maybe some green shoots do emerge. What's your question, Jack? So my question is, um, so I live here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, which is often termed to be flyover country, a manufacturing hub in the upper Midwest. Uh, we have a, a deep immigrant heritage like much, much of the Midwest does here in the States, a uh, large German, Polish, and Eastern European heritage. Uh, it comes out in our food. People make fun of us for being the place that loves cheese, cheese and brats. Uh, we're known to be a, a strong drinking state. Milwaukee actually has the most pubs uh, per population, so they say that for every every 15 people, there's a pub in Milwaukee. Uh, but it also comes out in our soccer culture. We have uh, two amateur clubs, uh, the Bavarians and the Croatian Eagles. Uh, the Croatian Eagles actually are the oldest uh, football club that was founded in 1922, and the Bavarians, I believe, were 1929. But I wanted to ask for, in your guys' particular regions, is there clubs that were founded by immigrants and keep their particular cultural heritage alive, which is very profound here in, in the States? Tim, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very common in, in South America. Sometimes the, the immigrant thing has run into problems. Um, two huge clubs in, in, in Brazil uh, were called Palestra Italia, 
um, obviously of, of, of Italian uh, immigrants. Now, that name, that didn't work too well when Brazil entered the Second World War on the opposite side from Italy. So both of them changed their name and uh, they became Palmeiras in Sao Paulo, who are the current Brazilian champions, and Cruzeiro in Belo Horizonte, who are the, the current Brazilian cup holders. Um, so that, that, that's huge teams. But you, you, you see a, a number of teams like this all over South America. Um, Chile, Santiago in Chile, Aldax Italiano, club of the Italian community, Palestino, a club of the, uh, of, uh, of, of the, the, the Palestinian community. Um, Venezuela, Venezuela is, is interesting for this as well because uh, Venezuela, football has made giant strides there in the last 20 years. Uh, and that the mass of the Venezuelan population historically have been much, much more into baseball than football. So the, the ones who are keeping the flame of football alive in Venezuela were these immigrant communities. So you get a, a, a Portuguesa there, you know, who, who are from the, from the Portuguese community. Uh, or you get clubs with a Deportivo it, Italia, obviously from, from the Italian community and, and, and t teams with links to the Spanish community. There's a Barcelona in, in Ecuador. Um, from uh, Barcelona of Guayaquil, who was set up by obviously immigrants from 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 uh, 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 Catalonia, so th this this immigrant thing is very very important to the, to the history of uh, of South American football. I don't know how many take it. Uh, totally seriously these days mm -hmm. and if you look at say Palmeiras in, in, in Brazil, they're from Sao Paulo where there is a huge Italian community uh, most of the people who, who have been presidents of Sao Paulo do have Italian names so that, that, that's obviously still very very um, important. In others, they've kind of blended in. When Vasco da Gama here in Rio was set up by the Portuguese community, and the old Portuguese people, they, 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 they will still tend to, to support them. But the ties of, 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 of maybe the American population take, take this thing of cultural of roots more seriously than a lot of people do in, in South America where the immigrants have, have, have kind of blended in a little bit more. I remember I've only been to the States once in, uh, for that, that Copper Centenario in 2016. And I remember spending some time, I think, I think this, this again was in, was in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, my hotel was on a university campus. And, you know, I would sit having a coffee and I'll be fascinated with all the chats around me of, of these young students who are saying, you know, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a third Dutch and one sixteenth Cherokee and whatever, you know, and just you know, in these conversations, <laughs> they all seem to be about what, you know, what the, the people's genetic roots were. By and large in South America, I don't think that that's, uh, that that's taken as, as, as seriously, although there may be one or two exceptions. And John, what about out there in Asia? Well, I think in, in much of Asia, I mean, the professional clubs are a relatively recent thing, and certainly places like Japan, Korea, and China, and often in Southeast Asia too, they tend to be, they tend to sprout from, you know, corporations or, or, or government bodies. I mean, in Australia, you had traditionally um, the football scene came, um, the clubs came from different ethnic communities in Australia, the old National Soccer League, which went bankrupt, I think, in 2004, um, had clubs from the Croatian communities and the Greek communities. Mm. Um, but I think the problems that the league had well, meant that when the new league was started in 2005, what's now the A-League, there's a, a definite attempt to you know, move away from the old ethnic, uh, ethnic side of the game, from the Football Federation Australia, make it a little bit more sanitised, and uh, bring in new clubs that didn't have that same kind of um, ethnic community. But also what you find in a place like Jordan, um, there's a club there called al Wadat, which um, is, is strongly, um, the, the identity comes a lot uh, in many ways from the Palestinian refugees that went to the country you know, in, in the 40s and the 50s. I think that is still you know, a major issue, a uh, major part of the club now. And there's a big rivalry in, in Jordan between al and um, you know, a lo another local team, al Faisali, uh, which this comes into play. But it's certainly not, I think, to the same extent as in South America or, or the US, because most teams, you know, are kind of imposed from above, if you like, and don't come up through the communities. Do you mind if I ask you a follow-up question? Go ahead, Jeff. Related? Mm. Uh, so with... Uh, I would say that probably soccer in the in the U.S. really started becoming more popular and not just an immigrants game, probably more in like the 70s, 80s, and definitely in the 90s. And we had a massive – I grew up in a, in a rural town that when we – I was the on our first varsity team when we got a soccer team. And, you know, we had a strong resistance 
uh, from our community because we were mostly played American football or baseball. And was, is there sports in your regions that would have maybe mm, conflicted or maybe been hesitant to have in a foreign game coming to, uh, you know, to their, to their States? Like, for example, I, I mean, this is, you know, culturally, I would imagine like, you know, Gaelic football in Ireland, that that was cultural, political. I don't know if like Aussie rules in Australia kind of has this mm. same thing that American football does to soccer. Was there native sports that were, that were um, hesitant of soccer coming in? John, maybe that's Yeah, one. I think certainly Such Australia great, would be. Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah, I think Australia would be like in Asia the, the, the closest to the US in, in, in sporting terms and definitely Aussie rules. Um, so probably... You know, um, occasions I go there, it's surprising how there is certain there is still some I think hostility towards football or soccer in in the mainstream in sections of mainstream media, and certainly Aussie rules is seen as you know a good old fashioned Australian game, mm. where football I think less probably less so now was seen as you know the 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 sport of the of of the immigrants and a little bit maybe less Australian. I think it's changed perhaps, um, but certainly you still see it when I go and. And they talk to football writers in Australia. You have, you know, kind of almost daily battles just to, you know, deal with this kind of hostility that they feel that they get from certain sections of, you know, of, of the mainstream media in Australia. I think, like perhaps like um, the US, um, lots and lots of kids play the game. I think in terms of participation, you know, the, the numbers are, are, are huge, but football still loses, you know, players to Aussie rules when they get to a certain age. And of course, cricket's still big. Um, and there's also rugby as well. So it's a very, very competitive um, marketplace that, you know, football has to operate in Australia. But, yeah, I think certainly there's been some hostility to to the game from the established sports. John, what about the other parts of Asia? Because I guess there are some really traditional um, sports in the likes of Japan and China. Um, and I guess the landscape has only recently changed maybe the last 30 or 40 years in terms of football, and particularly it's, you know, national leagues and international players going out to those countries. Um, how's it seen now? Has football really taken over the sporting landscape there? Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, in most of Asia, I mean, football's the number one sport or the number two sport, really. I mean, I guess in East Asia, in Japan and Korea, baseball would be you know, the big rival and, and there is a bit of tension. I mean, baseball was probably in these countries a bit more seen as the sport of the establishment to get, you know, much more support from the media, um, certainly in South Korea. But <clears throat> in China, you'd have basketball. I mean, India would be you know, and also an interesting one to, to look at, because cricket is, is huge. But, you know, I think in, in India too, football has become much more popular among the middle class and the urban areas. Um, so there's, there's still huge potential, but I think there's, there's, I don't feel I don't find you get the occasional conflict, but not the same hostility between you know the established you know sports um, in Asia than, and, and football. I mean, it's it's pretty smooth relationship. I mean, I think Australia would be an unusual case, maybe as I said, perhaps similar to the US in, in some ways. But I think in the rest of of Asia, I mean, football would be you know in, in most countries either, either you know the number one sport or, or, or not far off. Uh, okay, John, thanks a lot. Jack, are you still there? I am. I just wanted to ask you one question about the US soccer team, because, of course, your moment of the year was pretty negative at the start there. But just looking yeah. ahead, you've got a new head coach now, Greg Berhalter, the new uh, head yeah. coach of the men's national team. What do you think he's going to bring to the role? And, and actually, you know, what is your New Year's resolution in terms of US men's soccer? What should they be trying to do now? It's a great question and the little that I know I don't watch a lot of MLS but I've been doing some research on Greg Berhalter and him when he was when he was in charge of the Columbus crew and I think he brings honestly I don't I, I mean I don't know what I've read is that he will be a guy that assesses the players and, and comes up with a strategy that he's not he doesn't have a hard set rule a strategy he'll he'll use the players to the best of their abilities I was a little disappointed in the process because I hope that they were going to bring him on earlier than they did because then we already had um, you know, well, pretty much a full year without uh, a coach. We had an interim head coach for a year where you were hoping that he'd get get bodies and be able to get them you know, familiar with the system and, and all of that. So I, I guess I'm hopeful we'll see what the Gold Cup uh, does. Um, but in general, I mean, there's some 
some Americans that are making splashes in Europe. Uh, Tim Wea, who is with PSG, is now rumored to go on loan to Celtic, and I'm, I'm a Celtic supporter, so I'm interested to see how that mm. goes. Um, there's uh, so, so I, I, honestly, I don't know. Christian Pulisic, they say, is going to Chelsea. Yeah, I don't know yeah, we can that. say that um, the, the German newspaper uh, Bilder reporting this evening, uh, Christian Pulis, Pulisic, American star, star of Borussia Dortmund's team at the moment, uh, reportedly meant to be moving to Chelsea in the Premier League next summer. They're reporting that uh, this evening. Do you think that'd be a good move for him, guys? Let's 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 throw it to Tim. What do you think? Well, first, I just want to do something quickly on on uh, uh, Jack's question about mm-hmm. rejection of football because I think there's some fascinating stuff to uh, uh, to unearth there. Mm-hmm. And I think you can clearly make a distinction between the, the formal parts of the British Empire, uh, like the United States was in, was and, and Australia and so on. They tended to reject football. The informal parts of the British Empire and South America very much fits into that category. Mm-hmm. They tended to embrace football. There was resistance. I mean, in 1922, one of Brazil's most famous writers, Graciano Hamos, he wrote, now this football lark, it will never catch on. We don't need it here in Brazil. It will never catch on. Uh, we've got rowing. We've got our own activities. We don't need this football. It's, it's going to be a, a six-month craze. It's one of, the, one of the worst predictions that there has ever been. Why? Why did it catch on? A number of reasons. One is, you're talking about a time of massive urbanisation and, and, and football is the game of the city. So you've got lots of immigrants coming in, needing a common, you know, open to new things and looking for a common language, a common thing, right. and football provides that. But also the very nature of the game itself, that football, it, it can be interpreted in so many different ways. And it's great for the fellow with a low centre of gravity, which is the physical build of, of lots of South Americans. Right. So very, very quickly, they reinterpreted it and that this reinterpretation led to international triumphs and international recognition for a region of the world that doesn't get a great deal of those things. Mm. And, and so very, very soon, and within 10 or 15 years of Ramos saying, you know, football will never catch on, it was already a key part of national identity in this part of the world. And that, that process happened with just dazzling, dazzling speed. Uh, on, with with uh, Christian Pulisic, who strikes me as a very, very fine player indeed, mm-hmm. you worry, I suppose, at, at Chelsea, and, uh, and Hugh, you're much closer to this one than I am, is, is he going to get enough games or is he going to be kicking his heels in a very big squad? Mm. Yeah, that will be the main yeah, question. My, Go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. My, that is 100% my worry also. Uh, and so I, it, but, we'll, but we'll see. You know, they, maybe they see something... Uh, in him that he will be able. I don't know where they would want to play him at in in the in the national team. They can they've attempted to play him in a couple of different roles. Um, so I don't I don't know what the game plan would be for him there. I, I don't know where he falls in. Yeah, I guess the real question will be whether Mateo Kovacic leaves the club in the summer because I think there's a there is a creative role there, a midfield passer and drifter. I know Pulisic likes to attack more, likes to dribble more. Whether Willian will stay at the club, for example. Um, the one thing you do know with a club like Chelsea that wants to go far, if it does reach the Champions League for next season, um, it wants to compete on all fronts, all of the four major com- competitions in England and Europe. And in that case, they need a, a, a highly talented squad, number one, and a sizable squad, number two. And I think Pulisic will get his fair share of games, whether he starts every game for Chelsea will be up to him to prove. But obviously he's, uh, you know, a, a very fine player. And hopefully he can, if he does go to Chelsea, uh, get the opportunities. It's just whether he, you know, he's a regular starter. Of course, that's a the type of squad that has been full of stars customarily at Chelsea, as we've seen. Uh, Jack, really interesting to talk to you. Thanks so much. Get more with Five Live Podcasts. I'm John Pinar. This is Pinar's Politics. Welcome to Eye of the Storm. Greetings, Brexit casters. It's Adam Fleming in Brussels. Five Live Boxing with Costello and Buns. Five Live's EuroLeague football podcast. The Checkered Flag podcast. Welcome to Tailenders. My name is Greg James. Welcome to the Headliners podcast. At home with Colin Murray. Hello and welcome to you, me and the Big C. Discover your next favourite podcast. Search Five live using your podcast app hello you're listening to the world football phone in we're into the second hour i'm hugh wisencroft joined by tim vickery and john durden just a reminder of how to get in touch up all night at bbc.co.uk text 85058 you can tweet us at bbc5 live or call 
08085 909 693. Just had a text through. I've got two moments of the year. I didn't make it to Russia as I was pushed through a window. Long story, I guess. Uh, I got the bug following England after driving around France in 2016. My first moment of the year was being in the ground in Seville as the final whistle was blown. Words can't describe that feeling. The second, the whole game at home against Croatia. What an atmosphere at Wembley. I was truly moved that day. Never seen the uh, stadium like it before. And that's from Neil from Cambridge. Well, he said since Cambridge won promotion back to the Football League, but we'll leave that there and leave it with the big moments for England, I guess. Now, we've got a caller on the line who maybe doesn't sympathise with those, um, empathise, I guess, with those moments for England. It's Mark from Glasgow. Mark, what was your moment of the year? Well, I'm someone who's more of a world football enthusiast, Mm -hmm. long-term listener to the programme. My moment of the year this year was, uh, you know, the the newer teams qualifying from the expanded uh, African Cup of Nations Mm -hmm. and the Asian Cup. Uh, teams such as uh, Mauritania and um, Madagascar in Africa, as well as the Philippines, Kyrgyzstan and Yemen mm-hmm. uh, in Asia. Uh, my question is, question for John, really, does anybody other than they obviously mentioned earlier on about Thailand, Vietnam, is there anyone who you can maybe, anyone else you could see perhaps a return to prominence for Bahrain like they were in the early 2000s or someone perhaps a bit further afield, perhaps in Indonesia at some stage or the long shots for me, I want to see you because my friend lives there, uh, Hong Kong or even Macau or those type of teams. Right, yeah, well, yeah, good question. I mean, yeah, so next week the Asian Cup kicks off, you know, the Asia's biggest football competition. And uh, it's expanded from 16 teams to 24 for the first time ever, uh, which means we're seeing, as Mark mentioned, Yemen are in for the first time, uh, Kyrgyzstan qualified. Uh, Philippines are also qualified for the first time. And the um, you know, Philippines have a certain Sven Goran Eriksson in charge for this tournament, which will be, I think, very interesting to see to see how they get on in, in, the, in the tournament. I think um, in terms of up-and-coming powers in, in Asia, one that I mentioned, I think Vietnam really is making a lot of strides. They've got some um, you know, good youth programs there now and some uh, good academies and the, the talent's always been there, I think, but there's much more of it now. Um, with the national team, you have a South Korean man in charge, um, a coach uh, called Pak Hang So. He was part of the coaching staff from the Hiddink in 2002, and he's, he's been active in the K-League for quite a while. And he's a well-known figure in Korean football, was quite a pragmatic coach, and he's taken over the Vietnam national team and um, turned him into a much more hard-to-beat team, still technically very good, but a bit more defensive and a counter-attacking team. And um, they have some really, really good young players. And uh, the, the nucleus of the team comes from the under-23 under side that reached the final of the Asian Championships a year ago under Pat in, and the whole country went crazy and he became a hero. And then the, the Asian Games, which is a different competition, of course, that was last August. Again, the under-23 tournament, the Vietnam did well, um, lost to, just lost to Japan, I think, in a knockout stage. And then they qualified for um, the Asian Cup. Um, I think because of, of, of the way the tournament structured, I mean, 24 teams, so only eight teams don't progress to the second round. I think you, you have to fancy uh, Vietnam to get to the knockout stage and then see what happens. Um, but I think certainly for the next team to break out, I think, in the Southeast Asia should be Vietnam. Um, elsewhere, perhaps you mentioned Bahrain. I think, as you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the glory days of the last decade, I think, are far behind when they came close to qualifying for the 2006 World Cup and lost out to Trinidad and Tobago in the playoff. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see what happens at the Asian Cup in Iraq. Again, um, a very inconsistent team, but always got lots of talent, always exciting to watch. And in Indonesia, I think they're far, far away, still lots of issues in Indonesian football, unfortunately. Um, crowd violence, corruption, and all kinds of problems. Um, but a huge passion for the game. But I think Asian Cup starts next week. It should be a fascinating competition. See what happens. Mark, is that an answer to your question? Yeah, that was fantastic, actually. <laughs> I was much more in depth than I was. To, then I could try and comprehend there. Uh, and, and is there a particular club side that you support that you've maybe got a a wish for 2019? Maybe your country even? Uh, Scotland, um, <laughs> uh, as far as it goes, just don't mess it up. <laughs> uh, it's been 20, I remember being eight years old and being swept away by World Cup fever. Mm. 
in France and since then it's just been I'm a Partick Thistle fan so just hope we stay in the second tier of Scottish mm. football is just enough for me <laughs> Well, good luck with both of those. I think, you know, maybe difficult, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, thank you very much. Mark, thanks a lot. And, and listen, while we're on the, the topic of the Asian Cup uh, and a little bit to do with Scotland as well, we've got uh, Mike in air just asking, have any other nations taking part in the Asian Cup stopped their players from playing for their club sides as Australia have, d- have done by stopping Tom Rogic from playing in the Old Firm Derby later today? Um, and I'm not sure about that one. And are there any groundswell of opinion by clubs who, after all, play the players' wages that they are against this country over club FIFA rules? Um, I don't know what you guys think. I don't know. Do clubs stop many of the players um, in the build-up to the Asian Cup from for playing from playing for their clubs? Well, it's, it's a FIFA-recognised tournament. I mean, unlike the Asian Games, which uh, is a different tournament last year where clubs didn't have to release players. And there's a certain period where, of course, um, national associations have the right to to call up their players um, in a certain amount of days before the tournament starts. Um, Australia, um, Huddersfield Town said that, I think, the, 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 the midfielder, Abba Mori, mm. was injured, but Australia still called him up. Um, and it's interesting to see yesterday that the Philippines actually haven't called up um, Neil Etheridge, who's a goalkeeper who plays for Cardiff City, mm-hmm. which is quite a surprise. And I don't know the story behind that. But I think for Asian football, it's, quite, it's a new phenomenon because probably because the, the Asian Cup doesn't always take place in January. It depends where it's being held. And so this time, the tournament's been taking place in the UAE. And of course, you can't play in the summertime. It's too hot. So it's taking place in January. The next one will probably be in South Korea in 2023, and that will take place in, in the European summertime. So it won't be an issue then. But um, so it's not. It's really the first time, I think, that you know you have quite well-known Asian players who you know are being called up in the middle of a season. And of course, Tottenham have a uh, son. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the arrangement that they let him go to the Asian Games last August, so mm-hmm. he could win his military exemption, he's he's missing the first two games of a tournament with Korea, and it'll fly out. I think for the China game, that the final group game, um, but it's just the way it is. And I think um, as some clubs sign more and more Asian players, hopefully in the years to come, you know, uh, the international demands are all there, especially if you're signing Japanese and Korean and Chinese players because not only for the tournaments but also for the, for the home games, the friendlies and the qualifiers, it's a really punishing trip back um, to Europe and to East Asia. I mean, it really took its toll on Patchy Song at Manchester United. Um, but that's just the way it is. OK, that's the way it is. It is what it is. Let's um, change, I guess, from my Asia over to South America and Argentina in particular, Tim. Question comes from Ian in Bookham in Surrey. He says, has there been a reckoning in Argentina or South America about the declining quality of the region's teams since River Plate's defeat in the World Club Cup? If that fits, I guess they did obviously no, get to the World Club Cup, of course. Yeah, well, the, the South American champions always go, go to the semi-finals mm. of, the, of the Club World Cup. Uh, unfortunately, the tournament has just become a, an annual an annual drip, drip, drip torture, an annual uh, embarrassing show of the, the, the lack of relevance at the highest level of, of club football in South America. Mm. And it hurts me like mad to say that because that's how I make my living. Um, but, you know, but losing to Al Ain, who you know, had, a, had a great tournament, the, the, the local team from, from the Arab Emirates, but in their first game, they were 3-0 down to Wellington, a kind of semi-pro team from, from New Zealand. And River Plate managed to lose to them on, on, on penalties. And then in the final, uh, Al Ain had a couple of opportunities against Real Madrid early, yeah. but Real Madrid beat them 4-1 and had Real Madrid needed to score 20, they would have scored 20. Mm. Um, you know, and, and this was a side that held its own against against River Plate and uh, and won on on a penalty shootout. There, there, there's a couple of uh, denial tactics used. Remember that River Plate won the place in the Club World Cup as a result of beating their historic rivals Boca mm-hmm. Juniors in the final of the Libertadores, that very controversial final yeah. of the Libertadores that ended up with the second leg being played in, in, in uh, Madrid. Now, that's the biggest, highest-stakes game in the history of one of the great rivalries in, in, in world football. So uh, um, so the, the, the full-back position really is uh, the one that really mattered was, uh, was uh, beating Boca Juniors. I, I can't go along with that because... The historically importance of River against Boca is is not just 
local bragging rights, it's also a quest for excellence. And when the winners cannot overcome Al Ain, you can no longer call that the, the, the pursuit of excellence. And it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, it hurts me very badly, but these days, the champions of South America, it's not only that they're, you know, they're so far um, from the champions of Europe, who of course contain the best South American players, but they're also, they, they no longer have an advantage over the champions of, of other continents. Mm. Um, and th so the, the other fullback position, and you've got, you've got to remember that this is the first time that a team from Argentina failed to qualify for the final of the, the, the Club World Cup. Mm. So uh, this is just a one-off game. It's just one game. You shouldn't read too much into it. Again, I think that's false. Maybe the first time that it, it's happened to a team from Argentina, but it's now happened four times since, uh, since the Club World Cup was inaugurated in this mm. format in 2005 and two in the last three years. And ever since 2005, the semi-final where the South Americans play a team, a champion from another continent, the semi-final has never, not once, has it been an easy game. It has always been an easy game for the European champions. The European champions have always breezed through the semi-final. It's never been an easy game for, for the, uh, the winners of the Copa Libertadores. So although the uh, River Plate, when they went home, they had a huge celebration um, based on the fact that they'd beaten Boca Juniors, for me, it's hollowed out. It loses some of its gloss because what once was a game that meant if you won it, you were excellent no longer means that. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried about uh, club football in South America. It's falling further and further behind mm. and more and more places are emerging to, to, to buy its talent. Uh, um, Pitti Martinez, Gonzalo Martinez, who uh, played so well for River Plate in the final and scored a couple of wonderful goals last Saturday against Kashima Antlers, also missed a vital penalty against Al Ain. He's going to the United States, to uh, Major League Soccer, mm. to uh, Atlanta United. So that, that's another place that, 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 that's taking players away. Mm. So the, the quality is going down, I think, in tactical terms. Also, um, South American football is, is, uh, is club football, not national team football. Club mm. football is behind, the, is behind the curve. These, I think, are, are very, very worrying moments. And club football in South America continues to have very, very deep cultural roots. It's hugely important. It's magnificently supported mm. in spite of everything. It, 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 so it's very, very important. Mm. And it continues to produce great players. Mm -hmm. However, we're losing those great players at, a, at, a, at an ever younger age. Uh, and really, and the, the bulk of even the best teams, um, club football is made up now of promising youngsters on their way to Europe, grizzled veterans coming back from <laughs> Europe, and the people in between who are, who are not considered uh, not considered good enough to go, uh, and uh, that, that's not good. And it's happened so quickly. Mm. You only have to go back twenty years, when uh, you know, twenty years ago the champions of South America were on the same level as the champions of Europe. Yeah, for sure. They certainly aren't anymore. Indeed. Now, time for a, another caller. Thanks for that, Tim. We're going to speak to Wes in Singapore. Hello, Wes. Hey, you. How are you? Very well. Do you have a moment of twenty eighteen to tell us about? Um, I don't really know. I haven't thought of it. Um, no. but um, probably Hong Kong qualifies for EAFF championship. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, I like to ask um, John a question. Um, it's it's more oriented oriented for um Hong Kong football, and I don't always wonder why with an extended deal of twenty four teams in the Asian Asian Cup, how come Hong Kong cannot qualify for the Asian Cup this year? And did the Hong Kong FA do anything to to um, uh, keep Gary White as his head coach instead of um, letting him leave for Tokyo already? Right. Well, yes. I mean, as we mentioned, Gary White was a coach of Hong Kong for a short time before leaving to, to, to for Japan. I think you know, and as you said, also he he qualified Hong Kong for the East Asian Cup, which is kind of a biennial tournament with South Korea, uh, China and Japan, um, which is a, a fine achievement. Um, I think the problem with Gary White leaving was he, he kind of a dream job came available. I think that, that was the issue that, you know, Hong Kong national team was a step up from where he'd been in Taiwan. But again, the potential is limited in Hong Kong, as you kind of touched upon. I mean, maybe he, if he'd stayed longer or if he'd been in, in place 
during qualification for the Asian Cup, perhaps Hong Kong could have qualified because they weren't that far off um, in, in, what, in what was not a, an easy group. Um, but the, 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 the limited population and, and the playing pool is always going to be a problem for Hong Kong. I mean, I think with, with the Federation, perhaps, I, I don't know the details of what happened with Gary White leaving for, for Japan, but I, I do know that he's long wanted to work in Japan and he sees it as the, 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 the leading football nation in Asia. And perhaps if he does well there, that could be you know, a, a way into um, coaching in, in Europe. But I think um, Hong Kong, I think he was only there for a short time, unfortunately, but just couldn't compete with the, with the pull of Tokyo. I think going forward, Hong Kong, of course, has issues because like Singapore, where you are, and you know, just, just not the clubs, uh, you know, the, the, not the playing pool. And I think uh, there's always the, the issue of China. How closely does Hong Kong ally itself with, with, with China in a football sense? Because I know the FA is fiercely independent and wants to kind of tap in to the Chinese market as much as possible but without getting sucked in so much that there's no reason to have a Hong Kong national team. But I think it's tricky for them, but I think they, they couldn't keep Gary White, I think, just because the call of Tokyo Verde was just too big. OK, Wes, does that answer your question? Any follow-up? Yeah, I just want to have a little follow-up. Um, Tokyo Verde was so close to getting promoted to J1 last year, including losing to Jubilo Iwata. Isn't he getting himself into a tougher challenge there? Well, I think um, the challenge is a big one, but I mean, Tokyo is historically a, a big team as well. So if he can take them back into the J League and have 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 success in the top tier, it'll do his reputation, um, you know, real wonders. And then that should open the door for you know some really really big jobs. Hopefully, I think his career has been um, you know gradual steps all the time, and I think now he's where he wants to be, where he can really prove what he can do. Um, I think Tokyo can make it back to the top division. Then we'll, we'll really see what what happens. OK, Wes, thanks so much for your call. Uh, we're coming up to the news, well, six or seven minutes away from the news. So you, you've got time, John, to tell me a little bit about this. Because, well, firstly, this email reads, Hello, guys from Brisbane, Australia. Beer o'clock here. Um, there aren't any spelling mistakes in this email, which makes me think you haven't had quite enough just yet, but I don't want to encourage you too much. Uh, it's just a question to John about the A-League expansion teams, MacArthur, South West Sydney and East Melbourne, whether he thinks they're a good choice as opposed to the likes of South Melbourne, a historically famous team, or Canberra, who also had very strong bids and extremely unlucky in many people's eyes here, uh, says Tom. So what do you think of that? Right, well, yes. Um, so the A-League, the, 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 the Australian League that was started in 2005 is still governed by the Australian FA. Um, and it had 10 teams and been looking to expand to um, 12. Partly because I think um, the tournament has, the league has, has done very well, but it, it has stagnated a little bit, I think, over the years. In, you know, 10 teams or 9 or 10 teams as it has been, it's not enough. Um, you need more. Um, and the issue has always been how, where does it expand into? It's tried to expand expand before. It had it had a team um, on the, up the Gold Coast in Queensland, um, and that didn't last too long. And there's another one um, in Townsville in North Queensland where Robbie Fowler played there for a while. Mm. Again, that doesn't ex- uh, that, that doesn't exist now in, in the top tier. So I think there's a lots of um, nervousness in the FA about how to go about expanding. And I think having Adding another Sydney team, there's already two, and another Melbourne team, there's already two before as well, is a bit of a safe choice in that you, you're you're um, into the two biggest markets, the two biggest cities, um, you know, with, with all the sporting infrastructure. I think they, they see it as a safe choices. I think Canberra is a little bit unlucky because I spent some time there in the last Asian Cup in 2015, and there's definitely people I talked to really wanted to have an A-League team in the city, didn't have one, I think it liked football, and the games that took place in Canberra um, were well supported, and I think it's a shame that Canberra didn't didn't get a nod, but I'm sure um, if these two teams take off and, and, and do well, then there should be more teams to come in, in the coming years. But I think it's a safe choice financially, I think, and a bit cautious, but hopefully it'll work out, probably because the Air League side's fingers burned by moving to new parts of the country before. And Tom also asked from Brisbane, um, he just wondered about your thoughts on Australia's chances with a new coach in Graham Arnold, or who, in your opinion, are the top favourites to win? I assume he means uh, the Asia Cup. 
Right, yes, well, Australia are the champions. And even though Graham Arnold is the new coach, he's the second time uh, in charge of the Socceroos. He was in charge in 2007 Asian Cup when they didn't do very well. Um, but since then, he, he's developed his career quite well. Uh, Australia missing some players through injury, some injury issues. And I think that that's going to be a problem for them. I think Japan, probably the favourites. Um, you know, got a new coach and got some good young players coming through, coming off, coming off a good World Cup as well. They've got quite South Korea, haven't won it since 1960. Um, I think this time, in good form. But again, Korea also missing a couple of players through injury. I think if you, if you look past Japan, South Korea, Iran, probably the favourites as well. They've got uh, Carlos Quiroz in charge. Probably his last time in charge of Iran. He's been there seven or eight years now. He'd love nothing more than to go out winning the Asian Cup. I think Iran might well be the team to beat. OK, should be an eventful uh, tournament. Before yes. we get to the news, Tim, I've got one for you, a quick text. It says, have you got anything further to add? Well, I'll tell you the region the city, and then maybe you can guess who this question is going to be about. It comes to us from Graham in Harrogate. Any guesses? Yorkshire? None, none at all. Uh, Marcelo Bielsa, there, you, there you go. Have you got anything <laughs> further to add about Marcelo Bielsa, who is rapidly assuming messianic status in West Yorkshire? I found Tim's previous insight made me sound like a proper amongst the other Leeds fans. <sighs> Big test comes from mid-February onwards um, because you know, Bielsa and his influence goes far, far beyond the, the, the titles that he's won. Um, you know, he's influenced so many coaches. But in terms of the titles that he has won, it was all when, when Argentina was playing a short league system, you know, uh, only the sides only meeting once, so 19 rounds. And his previous incursions into European football, it's a, it's a high-intensity method of play. And he burns his side out well before the end of the season. So, uh, you know, with, with Bilbao and, and with Marseille, um, you know, by March, April time, they're really dragging weary carcasses around the field. Mm-hmm. Now, the championship, as we're seeing with Leeds, it's, uh, you know, it's a real struggle. Mm-hmm. And I'm delighted that it's going so well. And what my favourite image was from, from the last game when, they, you know, they turned it around right at the end and they scored... And they're celebrating, uh, and you know, you see Bielsa, you know, those mincing little strides of his. He's mm. yelling them to get back, you know, stop celebrating, get back to the centre circle. <laughs> that's that's Bielsa all over, class all over. So I'm I'm really really hoping it's going to work, the way that it's worked so far. Um, the, but the big test will come from mid February onwards. How much gas do the Le- will the Leeds players still have in, mm. in 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 the tank going into the business end of the season? Kieran says, as an Internazionale fan, a season ticket holder based in London, the favourite moment has to be Vicino's late goal versus Lazio in the last Serie A match of the 2018 season. To win 3-2 and clinch the final Champions League spot for Inter over Lazio. Great moment for him as an Ah. Inter fan. However, Ah. let's talk about something more serious for a moment because... Inter in the middle of something really serious in Serie A. Napoli boss Carlo Ancelotti saying that his team asked three times for their match against Inter Milan to be suspended because of alleged racist chanting that before a last minute goal gave Inter victory in their last match. Um, Guys, what do you think about how the football authorities are responding to incidents like this? It's been prevalent, of course. We've seen it previously in Italian football, but are there incidents like that in your regions and how are they dealt with? Are matches immediately suspended? Are clubs subsequently fined or are they banned? Should these rules be changed? Tim, I'll start with you. Well, I think we have to remember here that and people often talk about racism in football. It, it's racism in society, which is manifesting itself through football. But also, football is a, is a terrific forum to fight this, to draw a line and to say this type of behaviour is not acceptable and won't be tolerated. Um, racism is not an abstract. Uh, I think that the, the history of racism here is different from the history of racism in Europe. Um, here, it's mainly the legacy of slavery, whereas in Europe, it's totally tied up with with immigration uh, and uh, there, there, there seemed to me I mean looking from the other side of the, the Atlantic I'm very worried about the direction that, that Europe is taking 
which means that there will be, I fear, more of these incidents taking place. And it is up to football to become the battleground to draw a line and say this, this is, is, is not acceptable. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if... if I, know, I know some people are talking about taking points away. On one level, I don't, I, I, I don't like that. I may well, I may well be wrong. I think we have to listen to those who are involved in the anti-racism fight and work out what and take their opinion in, into account. What, what do they think is, is, is the best thing to do to use football as a forum to demonstrate the, the, uh, the unacceptability of, uh, of, of this type of behaviour? Mm, but, do you, you know, if we don't if we don't take points, for example, say we don't and it continues you know, the financial element of it, fines. You know, these clubs are extremely wealthy, many of them, and the fines usually are yeah. to the tune of just thousands of euros. Yeah, the, um, the, the, fines, the fines are derisory, aren't exactly. they? Which is why that, that, that's never worked. So the, the behind closed doors thing is clearly uh, a massive step forward mm -hmm. over and above fines, which, which are, are, you know, and it's not like the, the money, in, in the case of the fines, the money's not coming out of the pockets of, of those who've, uh, who, who've perpetrated the racism. Mm. So, you know, you, you wonder whether, how much that, that achieves, apart from perhaps getting the clubs on board and saying, well, you, you should be taking response, some responsibility for the actions of, of your supporters. Mm -hmm. But clearly the fines is, uh, is, is, is insufficient. Playing behind closed doors, depriving people of uh, the dep depriving those who've perpetrated the racism of uh, the, the possibility of going to the stadium and, and, and following their team clearly that 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 uh, that is likely to to achieve more uh, john what do you make of it well i think as tim mentioned i think it's a very tricky situation and i remember <clears throat> when when watching football um in blackbird in the 80s it was very common to hear <clears throat> where racism in the stadium um, in which less so these days, and I think it's, it's become not accepted, I think, by most fans. And perhaps, perhaps the punishment, when it comes, should reflect that. If, it's, if the punishment hurt, <coughs> hurts the club, then um, it's going to make most of the fans of the club you know, angry and annoyed. So if you do start something, uh, if somebody does say something racist or chants racist, racist things, then you'd hope that fellow fans would quickly turn around and stamp it out. Um, but... In, in Asia, and again, I think it's a, it's a very different situation to Europe. I think, um, and again, it's, it's hard to generalise because you've got so many different countries and cultures and languages and situations. Uh, but you, you don't really get these kind of high-profile um, incidents. I'm not saying it don't happen, but it's not well reported. Um, and you know, imported players tend to be, you know, from um, looked up to. Uh, you get lots of um, Europeans and South Americans who are brought in um, usually on bigger money than the local players get. Um, so you don't really have, I think it's not yet re reached Asia where authorities have to deal with these things. So there's not much of a precedent here at all. But I think um, Asia does, you, get, you see a lot of the reporting in the Asian media about what happens um, in these situations in Europe. <clears throat> the Raheem Sterling situation uh, when City played Chelsea was also, also very well reported. And it will be very interesting to see if something similar happened to a, a, an Asian player playing in you, know, what what the media would make of it over here, and sooner or later that would probably happen. But um, as yet, it's not really an issue that's at the, the centre of football in Asia as it is in Europe. OK, guys, we'll move on to something, I guess, more positive for our final 20 minutes. Uh, plenty of uh, emails and texts coming in. Interesting one for Tim. We mentioned him a little bit earlier. Um, do you think that Neymar has lost his edge moving to Paris Saint-Germain? And do you think he could be back at it if he moved to the Premier League or maybe at Real Madrid? What do you think? I don't think he's going to move to the Premier League. Real Madrid is, is I'm sure, more of a possibility. I know those Spanish papers, they've got to, they've got to fill a paper every day. You know, that, that's not easy. So, uh, you know, there's a story a day about Neymar maybe going there. Um, the, the, the big question of like whether he's lost his edge at Paris Saint-Germain, I think the answer starts to be supplied in those games against Manchester United. Because on really, on the, the French league is clearly beneath him. 
Uh, and it, it's almost like the season starts in March, you know, when, when you get to the knockout stages. And this time last year, he only played the first knockout game. He played it very, very badly. He should have been sent off, really, in that game. And then he, then he picked up his injury before the, before the, uh, the, the second leg. And, and we didn't see him again and, until just before the World Cup. So that, that question was really left dangling. Um, the question returns for these games against Manchester United. Um, but if if I was in his position, I wouldn't want to stay forever at, at, at Paris Saint Germain, and especially now as with with uh, Mbappe, the whole project of having the team built around him and him being the big star is also a little bit under threat. So uh, if if, uh, if I was in his shoes, I would that the idea of, of a move to Real Madrid would would be very tempting. Okay, one for you, John. Um, this comes from Akabuchi in Tokyo. Can I ask how much of the money that national associations make from FIFA? Um, sorry, how much does each country plough back into the development of the game and young players? Take Ireland as an example. The lack of investment, uh, Akabuchi says, is part of the reason the national team is now weak and is one of the reasons of the, for the rise in popularity of rugby. Do you see any lack of investment or maybe an extra investment from teams in Asia? Well, yes, it's patchy. I think at best would be perhaps the best way to describe it. Um, you have the very well-run federations like, you know, the, the, the JFA, Japan and South Korea and, and Australia would be much more professional and well-funded than somewhere like Pakistan, which is um, a federation which has received plenty of money from FIFA over the years. But not all of that seems to feed through to the places where it's supposed to be. And um, so it really, really does depend on on the country, um, as you'd expect in such a varied continent. I mean, you get so, you get some countries who don't who do almost nothing. But you, know, you see places like now, like, as I mentioned before, Vietnam and Thailand, countries that have started to invest in, in youth development and facilities um, and trying to professionalise all aspects of the game do see benefits quite quickly because um, you know if you can start developing decent young players, you can climb the Asian hierarchy quite quite rapidly and, and get to a decent place. Um, but yes, it, it's very, very, very the best to do it quite well, and the worst don't do it at all. Yeah, we've had an, an email in about Qatar and some of the stuff we were talking about about a little <clears throat> bit earlier. It says every country has to start somewhere when it comes to producing quality footballers. China. Russia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, all currently nurturing and developing their young talents to be top quality players. They have the money and the resources to go far in developing those at the grassroots level. They don't have to rely on foreign money, unlike the Premier League clubs. I reckon in 20 years' time, this uh, it's an anonymous uh, text, says, I reckon in 20 years' time, those countries can surprise us all, but only time will tell. What do you make mm. of some of those countries in... Um, Asia in particular and what improvement you think they can make over the next let's say two decades well um, the potential is massive I mean we've seen that um, in China in the Chinese league in just a short space of time from just this decade lots of money was spent and, and standards in the Chinese league have certainly risen quite quickly excuse me <clears throat> of course that takes time to feed through to the national team the Chinese national team um hasn't been performing quite as well. But money makes a big difference, of course. And in, in, if you go to Qatar, um, naturally it's a very rich country. Um, facilities it has are, are fantastic. I mean, I mentioned the Aspire Academy that is, is in the city. Um, and it's huge. And they, they get young players from all over the world and train them to the best of their ability. And, you know, and, um, I think now you're starting to see some of these players play for the national team. I mean, you do wonder with a, a country like Qatar that has a very, very small population base, how far it can go. Uh, but certainly, players, I mean, but if you can apply that to a place like India, again, in India, again, there's, there's more money coming into the game with the Indian Super League. Um, but that's only just starting. And the potential is, it really is massive. And uh, But a lot of it does depend on, as I mentioned, youth development, facilities, getting people to actually play the game. And we talked about on the show before in, in a place like China. I mean, people have always said about China, you've got 1.4 billion people. It can't be that hard to find 11 world-class players. Mm. But the problem China's always had is that people don't play football so much. You walk around the country, in the cities, you don't see people playing football. And I think that's 
that's got to be the real change, I think, in all over all, all over the place. I've been to, I've been to Qatar two or three times. I've never seen people playing football in the street. Mm. I've seen people playing cricket because lots of Indians and South Asian um, immigrants and, and, and workers there. But you just don't see people playing football on the streets. And I think and that's something hopefully that will change uh, over time. Um, Tim, what about John? John, can I can I can I sorry <laughs> can I hide that hijack for a minute? Because this question has always fascinated me. I've, I've never managed to to have a chat with John about this. You know, Asia has so many countries, and it, 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 from a, from a lad from Blackburn, it's such an <laughs> a, alien culture as well. How long did it take you until you kind of you thought you had a grip on Asian football? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't know really. I think I started out in South Korea and kind of radiated out from that. It seemed like a natural thing to do. Um, but it, it takes a long time. I think, and a lot of travel, I think, as well. I mean, there's certain, some parts of, I think if you haven't been to China um, and just walked around, and, and it would be very difficult to talk about Chinese football uh, at all. I think the same in West Asia, you've got like, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and UAE. Again, very uh, different cultures. But it, took, it takes years, I think. Um, and there's still some, some parts of the continent that, you know, I, I don't know very well. Um, I've been living out here for about 20 years and I travel quite often to go or to the countries, but still learning new things every day, try and read as much as you can and watch as much of the football, but just get out there as much as possible. I think um, that's, the, that's the best way, but it does take a long time. How long did it take you, Tim, in, in South America? Well, I've got I've got fewer countries and uh, also it, it's not such uh, an, an alien culture. Mm. Um the key year for me, looking back on it, I think really was 2001. And I moved here in 94. Uh, but 2001, by the end of 2001, I'd seen every game in the World Cup qualifiers. You know, so every game that the 10 countries had played in the World Cup qualifiers to the World Cup in 2002. Uh, and a lot of travelling as well. A lot of... of, of uh, two, 2001, I, I, I went to lots of places for the first time. I was in Uruguay for, to watch them beat Brazil in the World Cup qualifiers. I spent a month in Colombia for the Copa America. I spent quite a lot of time in Paraguay in the previous two years. I was in Argentina for the Argentina-Brazil World Cup game. I was in Ecuador on the pitch when Ecuador qualified for the World Cup for the first time towards the end of 2001. And I was in Uruguay again for their playoff against Australia where they booked the final place in that 2002 World Cup. So by that time, I'd seen enough games. I'd seen lots and lo lots of club games as well. I put in the hard yards and I'd done the travelling. Uh, and so, uh, um, yeah, I think I, I look back on it and 2001 is the year where kind of things fell fell in, into place. Uh, but I think John's task is, is so much harder because, you know, the continent is so vast, so many different countries, and it's so different from our own. Mm. I think that's one of the interesting things. I know we heard from Jack earlier talking about the MLS and football and football culture is so important in different parts of the world. I look at the MLS, I look at a new team, for example, like Inter Miami, you know, the, the team that David Beckham's associated with, basically coining, you know, what's Inter Milan's name and, and wondering whether they will forge a culture trying to, I guess, merge the two sides of sport in America, which is essentially franchise and commercial business, along with what in other parts of the world is hundreds of, well, at least, you know, 100 plus years of football teams with history and tradition and whether they can sell to football fans, in particularly, for example, Miami, where people have supported teams in South America for many, many years or teams in Europe and in Spain, for example, many, many years. You know, maybe Asia is an example of a, a newer, obviously no, nowhere near as new, but a newer foot, football culture being established and that maybe that can be, a, I guess, an example to, to leagues like the MLS. What do you think, John? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, it does depend on where you are, but mm. you see... Australia, maybe, for example. Yeah, I mean, Australia would be, I think, as we mentioned, the, the closest example to the US <clears throat> on this side of the world because the, the, the competitive marketplace and, and the different sports and history is, is, has some similarities. But I mean, in Japan, we've seen, you know, the, the, the J League only started in 1993. Mm. So it's only 25 years old. Um, the, the oldest league, <clears throat> excuse me, the oldest professional league in Asia is the Careers League. We started in 1983. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, fucking my thought. Um, so you see um, how things happen very quickly. 
Um, and clubs are still trying to build identities. I mean, some countries do it quite well, like Japan, um, where it gets involved in the local communities and really, um, and, and that really has benefits. I mean, but in a place like Korea, clubs haven't done that quite so much, and China as well. Um, so there's all these different parts of um, ways to kind of develop and, and modernize. Um, I think certainly from the Asian point of view, Japan leads the way in, in, in the setting up the leagues and the organization and the infrastructure. And you see now in places like Southeast Asia, uh, countries trying to follow the Japanese model, and maybe which might be the way forward for them as well. Um, so, and, and also you, what, what you have now that you didn't have maybe 20, 30 years ago is much more greater awareness of the world of football around as well with you know, the internet and TV, which makes my job easier, I think, as, uh, at the same time. But there's a lot of you know people watch a lot of European football um, and they study more about the game and I think there's more influence from that side as well. So I think good ideas travel well. And I think um, certainly Japan and I think China are trying to follow the Japanese way as well with getting young players to play and get, get um, communities involved in the, in the local clubs. OK, John, thanks for that. Um, we're drawing to a close-ish, but there are a couple of questions regarding Brazil left on the table, Tim. Uh, a question about football is coming from Philip in Nottingham. It's about style of football. Uh, he says, back in the times there were Pele, there was Zico, that whole style of football. He's, his question is really, what has changed in Brazil's style of football aside from the pace since that era? Um, they, they, uh, they got very, very, they were very shaken by what happened uh, against Holland in the 74 World Cup. Where Holland, on in the course of that competition, Holland basically rendered South American football obsolete. Um, they, uh, they brushed aside Uruguay. Uruguay didn't have the ball for any one of the 90 minutes. Um, mm. Holland beat Argentina 4-0. And then in the semi-final, they beat, Uru they beat uh, Brazil 2-0. And Brazil were the, were the reigning champions. And it was, a, it was an entirely new threat. So, and w w when people talk about the, the total football of Holland in 74, they think about the exchange of positions and so on. Mm. But what really struck the Brazilians was the way that Holland pressed. They'd never seen this before. Uh, you know, if, if you watch back in 1970, the midfield maestro was, was Gerson. And the time that he had on the ball, the time to decide what he was going to do with the ball was, was amazing. And suddenly, you know, back four years later, you get half a Holland charging straight at you. So th then Brazil became absolutely obsessed with the physical development of the game. And they decided that a, a possession-based form of football could no longer thrive. And they were confirmed in this in their own minds when their very attractive side didn't win and in fact didn't reach the semi-finals in 1982 so what they looked to do then was to bulk up um, and uh, not play possession-based football instead everything was going to be done on the counter-attack so quick breaks down the flanks and that that was the, the basic template that they, that they then took in that they became a very big physical side that didn't look to play a possession-based game uh, and i remember 2005 the very tournament when uh, I was seeing Messi for the first time. You know, Messi was half as high as everyone else and oh. was, was just running rings around them. Um, Brazil, then they, they were saying their official position that right from the start of, of uh, their youth development process, one of the things that was most important to them was size. They wanted physically big players. And so when, when, when Guardiola came along with Barcelona, with Xavi and Iniesta, it caught Brazil totally on the hop mm. because that Brazil had decided that that, that that simply wasn't possible. Now, you couldn't have little guys in a possession-based game. Uh, obviously, no one told Guayoli it was impossible because his side went and did it anyway. And, and really, Brazilian football has yet to recover fully from that, uh, from that shock. It's still, it's still chasing its tail a little bit. Uh, and if you look at domestic football, there, there, um, there's a possibility perhaps next year of two or three more possession-based sides. But really, it's all counter-attack. Mm. Uh, and and it, it's, it's quite hard to watch, you know, and especially if, if you have in your mind the, the, uh, the, the stereotypic image of Brazilian football as, as being this very romantic game. There are still wonderful individual players produced, mm. but collectively, um, I think that's changed a little bit with the national team since uh, the current coach took over Chichi in 2016. There has been an attempt to get, bring the lines of the team closer together and, 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 and to pass the ball. And I think uh, when, when they really fire together, they are, they are terrific. But 
they're still behind the vanguard of of what happens in, at, the, at the best level of, cl- of club football in Europe. Okay, before we go, just a few minutes left. Let me let me ask you both, John. What is the thing you want to see in 2019? Do you have a premonition? Is there a thing you're going to start doing or stop doing around football in 2019? On a personal level, um, nothing special. I think I hope the Asian Cup. Uh, kicks off the year very well in January. It'd be good to see some high-quality football, um, some new stars made. Um, I think from an Asian level, um, you know, a bit more belief in Asia itself would be nice. I think there's always a little bit too much looking um, to uh, overseas and to Europe for for us a bit more belief and um, for the fans to show a bit more love to Asian football rather than watch um, English football or Spanish football. Um, but yeah, I think it, for me, just carry on and hopefully see some great football and maybe even make it South America for the Copa America. That would be fantastic. I don't know if it's possible, but I'd love to do that. Tim, what about you? Well, obviously, my my big hope for the year is uh, the, the, the possibility of uh, laying out the red carpet for for, for, for Johnny Durden <laughs> to, to come over and watch... Uh, Watch Qatar and Japan in the, in, in the, the 29 Copa America, um, 2019 Copa America. Very much looking forward to that. It is mainly, for the vast majority of teams, it is a warm-up tournament for the next set of, of World Cup qualifiers. So most teams will use it as a laboratory. Um, for Brazil, it's different because Brazil are at home and their recent record in tournaments is so poor. So you know, the pressure is really, really on them. And the coach knows that if they don't win, he's probably getting his P45. It's, you know, he's, he's probably um, looking for a job. So the, the pressure is really, really on. So I'm looking forward to, to that. Um, I'm looking forward very much to, to the under-20 championships that start in, in just under three weeks because it's a gold mine of, of, uh, of, of young talent. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, and the greatest thing about what I do is, is that the chance to, it's like going to the cinema and seeing the trailers, getting a sneak preview mm. of the trailers. You know, there's a few people who I'll have the privilege to watch this year, who at the moment are not even household names in their own home. But, you know, <laughs> let's fast forward two or three years and they will be famous all over the globe. So the chance to watch them first, that is absolutely priceless. So that, that's what I, I, I hope to be enjoying over the next 12 months. Indeed, you did tell us to watch out for Venezuela's youngsters as well. You were right about that one, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, the, the, Venezuela is the one team from South America who have never made it to, uh, to a World Cup. Um, but the under-20 generation who lost to England in the final of, mm. of the last under-20 World Cup, watch them go. There's, there's, some, there's some really interesting players, but the pressure is on them. They've mm. never had to deal with this pressure of you're going to qualify. Now that they have that pressure, how do they cope with that? That's going to be fascinating as well. <laughs> 